Rodriguez. So this is Dr. Joanna Rodriguez, and I just want to give you a little bit of background on her before she um, goes into her presentation. So Dr. Rodriguez is an assistant professor at USU School of Veterinary Medicine in, in ADVS. She developed and is the section head of the Clinical Pathology Laboratory housed within the Utah Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. She obtained her bachelor's degree at Western Washington University, followed by a master's de degree at Portland State University. At Oregon State University, she obtained a doctor of veterinary medicine, followed by a residency in veterinary clinical pathology with board certification in 2011. Prior to her appointment at USU, she worked as a clinical instructor at Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine. So if you guys will join me to welcome Dr. Joanna Rodriguez. All right, thank you. So basically I wanted to start this presentation with real life what happens every morning that I lecture. It's chaotic, I don't know what's going on and I need the students to tell me what did we talk about last lecture hour. So it took me about three, say five minutes to get this stuff up and running, okay? I have many things hooked to my computer right now. I had to get the power cord, I had to get my HDMI, my eye clicker set up and I also have an extra microphone so that I can record my lectures. I did this, I have been here now for two years, I'm going to go into my third fall, uh, this term. The first year that I started, we did not have the ability to record lectures, okay? And so I wanted to. And so I can use my, my laptop to record my lectures. And, and I did that because I taught at Washington State University uh, College of Veterinary Medicine prior to that, and the students loved it. Because if they either couldn't be present in class because they had something else going on, um, or they just zone out. Um, at some point in time, they can go back and study. Okay, so I got used to having my lectures recorded, and so I got all of this stuff so that I could use my personal computer so I could record my lectures. So I have all this stuff, so I do spend the first few minutes of class setting up. I am not a big technology fan. My favorite professors were those that came to class every day in their, in their disgusting farm clothes, and would go and walk up to the board and just write some stuff down. I still remember those lectures, okay? You can ask me large animal medicine and I could do it. I feel like I could go work on a horse right now. Small animal, eh, dodgy. It depends on the day. I have to share with you our demographics a little bit to understand the students that I am lecturing to because that could dictate whether or not what I am going to teach you today will work for your class. At Utah State University, I teach approximately 30 students. They're all veterinary students, so these students have some sort of bachelor's degree prior to us coming in. These students are housed within one classroom. All morning from eight to noon, they have lecture every hour, okay? The faculty rotates around them. So they're in one little classroom sitting there, and the faculty often run over because they need to know everything, and they do, unfortunately. Will they retain it? They're lucky if they get 10 to 20%, and we realize that. Now, of course, in my course, they need to know 80% to survive, so. That's why I make them pay attention even more. Um, they have lectures five days a week, and then three of our classes in the sophomore year fall curriculum that I teach, they have at least three laboratory sessions. So they're in class all of the time. And then they have extracurricular activities as well as some things that we make them do. I make them do medical records and stuff outside of class. I make them develop cases for which then they have to start working on medical records. We discuss at nauseum in our curriculum how we can use the flipping the classroom technique. With that knowledge that for each lecture hour that student is in my class, they need to do at least two hours at home. There are not enough hours in the day. And so all of us are trying to implement just a little bit of something that we can do so they're learning stuff ahead of time. Our students become that passive learner in a way. They are fried. They come, they sit in a chair, and you're just lecturing at them. And we try and find ways to get them to become more integrated, but it is hard. This curriculum is taxing for our students, and I acknowledge that. So again, when I come in, I look like this, and so what I've done is I grab a couple of my students, and hey, Jason, can you, okay, yep, yeah, I gotta get, all right, I clicker, do, 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 okay, over, right, oh, Panopto, you know, and so I have my students helping me with that while I also have them, um, Potentially, once I get my PowerPoint running, I might utilize an iClicker question. It's just it takes me five minutes to get this up and running. I'd love to have this going at the beginning of class so when they're walking in, 
Then I have, here's an example of a question. So the first couple minutes when they're setting up, getting their computer, I want all my students looking at this so that we can talk about this. And this will relate to the previous lecture that I had. And then I have the students use the eye clickers. I usually have the first slide that says eye clicker, and then they all kind of grumble and they get it out of their bag because they really aren't all that excited about finding it. And then half of them forget. And the whiteboard thing, some of my vet students actually do have whiteboards. And I had Nate in the back row last year that he forget his eye clicker every time, but he had his whiteboard. And so Nate would write down something and hold it up in the back of the classroom. So you get all sorts, and you get to know our students very, very well. The other thing that I do in my class, and you'll learn a little bit about the course that I teach through this, is I use a lot of case studies because that is what my class is about. It's about how do you interpret laboratory results. And so for an example, here is a 10-year-old female spayed domestic short hair cat. She presented to your clinic uh, because she was lethargic, so she wasn't moving much. It's a cat. Um, and anorexia, which is a big deal for this cat. Okay, this cat eats anything. Uh, a little background history, this cat is a birder, active, active birder. She will, my neighbor, my neighbor, oh, she's so angry at me because this kitty is over there all the time, but uh, it's hard having a serial killer locked up in your house as well, too. You worry about your own safety. So um, she presented, and, um, and you did some blood work on her, okay? This is actually mini kitty in my office. This is when you're a veterinarian and your own animal gets sick. You have IV fluids running in your office for your own pets some days. Okay, I'm in administering some antibiotics because of what happened. Anyway, um, so then I will give them that presentation and then I give them this data. And so I say, okay, two minutes, look at this. I want you to interpret the leukogram and the erythron for me and tell me what your next diagnostic step will be. And so with the information that they learned from my class, my class is the first class where they're actually learning how to interpret blood work and laboratory results. Okay, so I've given my students a few minutes now and they're gonna say, Dr. Regis, um, this patient has an inflammatory leukogram, so there's inflammation somewhere in this patient. Once I give them more information, let's say she's got inflammation in her gastrointestinal tract, and then I'll say, okay, what are differentials? And so that's how we use stuff in my class, and that's how we apply the learning. I needed another modality that wasn't electronic to engage my students. Um, one, so that Instead of just throwing an eye clicker question at them, I don't grade them, okay? I just put them up there to get them thinking again about my course. Because again, these students have so much coming at them. And so to go, oh yeah, ClinPath, okay, good, we're talking about blood, check. And so I use those, and it doesn't mean that they studied it, they may not have looked at this. I acknowledge the fact that I guarantee half of them haven't looked at my stuff since that last lecture. I know it, okay? but they're just trying to retain what we talked about in that last lecture. So to me, that's kind of passive. What did they gain from it? I know they haven't studied it. I wanted something more that they would be active, okay? They need to go look something up, but I know they don't have time. And so I needed something that can take them one or two minutes to look up. And I tell my students, if you forgot, that's fine. Open your notebook right in front of you. Open that slide. Tell me two things that you learned last time. It can be a fact. It can be something more profound. And so I'm holding them responsible to tell me what we talked about. And it requires them looking through the previous lecture notes and looking through the, the PowerPoint. And they can talk to the person next to them, whatever. I don't care. Just tell me two things that you learned. That brings the entire class then into, all right, last week we talked about inflammatory leukogram. Okay. Check, I think I remember that case she talked about. Check, okay? Then um, what I get from this is more selfish, why I'm doing this in this format that I am. One, they are telling me what they learned. Now, most of my students actually will highlight things that they heard me get on my soapbox about, okay? And sometimes they bring out other stuff that I think, oh, I didn't think I stressed that, but that's great. So it gives me feedback. Sometimes I, I make my test questions off of this. What did the students hear? Okay. And then when they reiterate that, then all the classmates go, oh yeah. Okay, so to me that's good test material. Secondly, what did they learn? Did they learn it or didn't they? And I utilize that and I'll talk about the question part, is they have to ask me a question. It doesn't have to be from the exact last lecture, but it can be trying to integrate all of the material. Did my cat learn not to eat birds? No, okay. 
She did not. And now we are trying a series of bells and collars and other things. And my neighbor still talks to me. And now, as a teaching person, you learn from those people that you appreciate. I already told you, my favorite professors were those farmer, uh, farm vets that came in and they're grubby and they just wrote on the board, turned around, said this is three things you know, need to know about equine metabolic disease. I remember those so vividly. It was slow, they didn't use current technology, um, and you could discuss with them. If you had a question, it was at a pace you could retain. And it didn't overwhelm you compared to one pathologist that had 300 slides an hour of lesions, of kidneys. <laughs> I don't remember a thing. I remember two things from that lecture, maybe. Two pictures. What were they? I don't know. So I had one cardiology professor I adored. Everybody liked him. He was very, very linear, which is great for a type A veterinary type student. Um, and he expected you to read that material ahead of time. So flipping the classroom sort of thing. You had to read small sections. They weren't huge. For his class, you were prepared, okay? Because he would come in and say, hey, Polly, what are three things that can cause AFib? And you kind of go, okay, three things, three things. I go, okay, well, there's, and so you're thinking, you're on your feet, you didn't know he was gonna call on you, you don't know what he's gonna ask, all right? It kept us on our toes, we remembered that material, we studied it, we looked at it ahead of time, then when we discussed it in class, we got it. So most of us appreciated that, except for my classmates that were for this, intelligent students, not people to be called on on spot, okay? Um, they couldn't tell you their name if you called on them like that in that format. And I felt for them. I personally am very comfortable, but I acknowledge these other students that aren't comfortable with this. And I liked it. The majority of us benefited from it, but I guarantee those students then didn't hear anything for the next 15 minutes because their blood pressure was pounding in their ears after that. I wanted to do then something um, that will still hold my students accountable for looking at material even briefly before we come to lecture so that they know what I was talking about ahead of time, um, but without too much stress and drama. And so my modifications were um, letting them know this is something we will be doing every day. Every day we walk into class, you need to tell me two things that you learned from last time, and I want you to have a good question too, some discussion question. And that's all I did, simple, <laughs> no technology, um, it requires them, if they forgot, they can just flip their notes open and ask something. Most of my students are at such a high level. We have such a small class, it's like a family, so they don't always care about looking stupid <laughs> in front of their classmates. So, so sometimes you get some goofy things, but at the same time, the most students, they know that I'm doing this for them, and they ask extremely good questions and things, they will flush out issues that I didn't know I didn't cover well or other things. Oftentimes it's things I can't answer. And I love that, and I totally do the thing, you know, I can't answer that. I'm gonna go look some stuff up or give you some extra resources, depending on how it is. And so those are, that's, um, so I let them choose the material, and then how, the format that I do is, is I still, there's still an element of surprise. You still don't know if you're gonna get called on. So the first week I do volunteers. Hey, who can do this for me? and they will volunteer. But I want that element of surprise. I want them all to prepare. And so um, it was fun writing my P&T material because last year they all wanted to, they were questioning whether I should put the word poop in my P&T material and I thought that's pretty benign and it is a dog poop bag. So um, I'm in a veterinary curriculum so I have my uh, unused dog poop bag from my dog Gordy. He lets me borrow that. And I cut up their names and just put them in the bag. And then I walk around. First thing I do before I set the stuff is I have somebody draw a name out of the bag. And that's all I do. Um, that student who has their name drawn has to tell me two things that they learned from the previous period. And then they have to ask me one topical question related to overall course material or to that one lecture that they just didn't quite get. So, um, if a student isn't absent, which occasionally happens, uh, believe it or not, not often as much as I think it should, uh, but they're usually there. But if they're absent and I draw their name, what I'm gonna start doing this year is I'm gonna hold them accountable and I'm gonna have them post on the discussion board two things that they learned and one question. And uh, so I'm gonna start doing that this year. We'll see how effective it is. I'm not gonna assign points to it. I have a feeling just because of the nature of my students that they will do this. Um, but we will see, you know, for other courses, there may have to be a point value, and I'm gonna discuss that a little bit uh, later on. 
at that time, then another student will be called upon to give those same things. So we still can come in. Everybody knows there's that element of it might happen. I have to prepare ahead of time. Very simple. So I do expect them to come prepared. Now, if you get that student that uh, comes unprepared and they're just kind of lethargic, what do you do? So these are just some questions. How would you work in that role? And I will tell you <laughs> an interesting story. I, I, this was just my pilot thing I did last year. And um, so it was going great the first week, fine. Second week when I finally started having to draw the names out of the bag, I got this student, and I don't know if anybody remembers Breakfast Club the movie, but there's the one character who's very shy and very quiet. She usually has her hair over her face. And I remember the one picture where she's drawing and she literally makes snow by doing her dandruff and drifting it over her. Anyway, so one name got picked out of my bag. So and so, please tell me two things you learned from last time and then one question. I, I don't have anything. Okay, so now you know this is expected of you and, and I would appreciate it if you could just tell me two things. You got your notebook right in front of you you go ahead and just open that up, anything. I bold, I highlight things, just pick, you know, alkaline phosphatase measures liver, something. Okay, just two things, you know. Okay, well, I'll get back to you, all right? I will get back, you go look those things up and I'm gonna keep doing this. Anybody else have questions? Five questions pop up from other students. So they're talking, we're working. All right, so-and-so, do you, did you find something to look up? I, no, I don't have anything, okay. So I'm serious about this and I'm going to come back to you. Now if, if you get the, the point, yes, I am very strict with my students. These are going to be doctors in two years. They are going to be answering to their clients, um, to other people. They're going to be on clinics. They're expected to know things, okay? So yes, I call on my students. They have to think on their feet. There is many, many things expected of these people. And so I said, okay, I'm going to come back to you in 30 minutes and I expect you to do this. By the time I came back to her in 30 minutes, it was complete shut down. Okay? At that time, Riga thinks, okay, we have an anxiety problem. This is more, I stop, we go away. We have a small enough class, they know each other, this is second year in their curriculum. I go immediately upstairs to our student assistants and say, what's going on? Oh yeah, about that. So yes, I found the one student with severe anxiety <laughs> and I put them in that horrible thing. So things happen and that's my story. Um, did I continue it? Yes, I did. So the biggest issue I had with this modality, though, is how to deal with lots of questions. My students can keep me for 10 to 15 minutes ahead of my lecture now um, asking really important topical questions that I need to address because they are important for their discussion. And sometimes it pushes my lectures then, and I will actually start lecturing a little bit later. So I have to adjust things. But the number of questions I get from this now is huge and I have to figure out a way then to compare this to just using my eye clicker versus doing this modality and that's something else that I'm going to bring up. Um, students that have their names picked multiple times, I only have 30 students and I have only so many lectures a term and how to deal with that. Well similar to the card system, those students, I need to put those back in the bag because if all of a sudden I start throwing names out of the hat then I'm by the halfway through the term half my students aren't going to come prepared and so I need to actually continue to um, keep their names in there. And so some of the things that I'm still then trying to figure out to keep them serious and actually help other people to use a similar modality is if you want them to take it seriously and you need to, how can you assign a point system, okay? For my students, it would be difficult because not everybody's going to get called on. Some people are going to get called on multiple times and I haven't figured this out, but I was kind of thinking, okay, what if 80% of the time students, you know, were prepared for it. If 80% of the time, then everybody gets a point or something like that. I'm still coming up with ideas and would love some suggestions. And then the other thing that I kind of talked about as far as how to determine effectiveness. Now, as a teaching uh, emphasis tenure track faculty member, I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I measure um, effectiveness of this modality? And so I'm trying to come up with some ideas and uh, interviewing students to determine perception. I can kind of do that, but how do I measure impact? And that's something I may have to go through my lectures and determine how many questions were asked compared to days I don't do it um, or something like that, but I'd be curious. Um, before I go into evaluations, one thing that I did do is a modification because again, I did this because I don't want to intimidate students. I want them to feel like they can come to class and not be afraid I'm going to call on them. With that student, I worked extensively with her um, and I said, and, and we talked and she said, I do want to be, 
I do want to be called on. I do want to be held accountable because she knows the profession she's going into. Okay? I said, look, I don't want to put you on that spot again because it's only going to make things worse. So let's, let's make a, a happy medium. How about you write things down on a piece of paper and then um, either give it to me ahead of class. If you get called on, I'll read it or just hand it to that person off to you. Um, so that was an option we did with her, and that worked just fine. And actually, she started volunteering later on when she got to know our class. And so she got more comfortable as we went through, because it is a small family group class, so you do learn uh, to work well. And you learn that I'm not actually there to hurt you. <laughs> um, and so how did my students feel? And so this actually, I did not ask these students, but in my idea evaluation, some of my students did volunteer what they thought about it. Um, and so a lot of my students actually felt it was pretty good. Um, it's, they commented on that um, it helped with each lecture, thinking about it after class, which helped them to study. Um, it made them look at the material again, and repetition, repetition is key in our curriculum. Um, it was helpful to stay on top of the material and be prepared for class. So again, they knew what they were coming into in the morning. Um, the pace, oh, this person liked the pace, the repetition, using the eye clickers and the two answers in a question ritual at the beginning of class. They depended on it, they knew it was coming, they knew what to expect. Um, and it just helped them nudge, review this material before our first exam in four weeks after uh, we start the curriculum. What things would you do to change or improve the contents? I had five people that actually mentioned two answers in a question. And then I had one person who said, I would do away with the two questions and an answer. And so that made me giggle a little bit just because it's like, well, they kind of missed the even title of it. But of course, everything, not everyone is going to like everything. And yes, and I am a pushy person. I expect participation of my students to some degree. I do appreciate those students. You know, I've, we have some great students that just sit at the back of class and just nod the whole time. Um, and I totally respect those. Those students are awesome doctors. And so everyone participates at their own level, and I appreciate that. Um, so, no, not everybody likes it. I acknowledge that. Um, how do I feel about that, though? It was piloted last year, and so I'm making subtle modifications again this year. I'm going to say, hey, if you're really uncomfortable about being called on, write it on a piece of paper. Every day be prepared. That'll make that one student, at least, really take it seriously every day because they'll come to me with that piece of paper or hand it off to the person next to them. If I get called on, do this, okay? Um, or if they know they're going to be absent, they could just have that there and ready if they run to a conference or something. So it is something that I'm going to continue. Um, I really do emphasize that it is the student's responsibility and they need to be held accountable for learning this material. Um, most of our classes are lectures. We come in, we lecture, we walk out the door. And it's just, they try to absorb and then at home work as much as they can on whatever they can grasp. But it is very, very hard. Um, selfishly, I like it because it's real-time feedback and everyday feedback of what they did or did not learn effectively in my class. And a lot of that comes out in the discussions. Uh, it, it really helps me um, become a better lecturer and um, I can make adjustments very quickly. Uh, when I hear something was either misspoken in class or didn't quite effectively communicate it, I quickly then that day I go right back to work and I put something on the discussion board or I find a better references better than what I have. And so they get it out there right away when it's still fresh in their heads. So um, it's a simple, silly thing and I felt foolish for uh, submitting an abstract for, to present it here today, but at the same time it has been so effective for me. It is not technology based. Um, you can make modifications the way you want, but it's similar to doing an eye clicker thing. Um, but to me, it's almost even, I get more information out of it from my students. And there's, you know, those questions of, you know, is it going to work for a class of 120? I'd still try it. Um, you know, I, I would probably make some modifications, but yeah, I really have enjoyed it. And my students apparently did too, the fact they even mentioned it. So um, I'd love to take questions or comments at this time. Or two answers. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Polly. Yeah, that's, yeah, and so the comment is, you know, really, do we, do we, do we need to push, you know, a lot of us are kind of, well, I'm an introvert by the Meyer-Briggs things, but truly, if you see me, you're seeing me present, I am an extrovert when I am in front of people, okay, I can present, do I really need to expect that shy, quiet person to be like me, you know, and I think that's a good discussion, um, and if I was teaching anything else, I would totally respect that person who wants to be in their shell, because I know that they have just as much value as that loud person that I, I had one student that you had to look at her and she knew to pipe down because she talked too much. Um, you know, the reason I can get away with this is because it's my profession. I know what these students are going to have to get into on clinics. You know, I know who they're going to have to answer to. I know that I am not going to be that hardest friend, person that they're going to um, confront. And so my challenges are actually more benign than what they will experience later on. And so it's to kind of start getting some of those students to start speaking out, because once they get to fourth year clinics and they ask them to present their case, what their plans are, it's kind of a practice for that. And so, no, it may not be the best for every situation. And I would come up with a modification in a different situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, please. I totally agree with that. I see my students, once they get in the clinic, you can have the quietest student that doesn't outwardly participate in a lot of activities. And once I see them work with clients, they are a different person and they are fabulous. And so that's why um, everybody definitely has their skills. And they come out in different situations for sure. And I love seeing that. Yeah, in the back. We have, um, in the veterinary curriculum, we actually have a student psychologist specific to our curriculum because of the high rate of anxiety, stress, and potential suicide in medicine in general. So we have, as soon as that happened, I went right up to our student assistant person, and I had that, um, that psychologist in my office within an hour, or at least on the phone, yeah. And I, I work with that person a lot, with a lot of my students. So yes, 